Honorable Governor Shri Bharat Nirvanshu, Mr. Yatin Kakotkar, our President, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to all of you, and a warm welcome to today's lecture. We are very honored and pleased to have with us Lord Meghnath Desai, who has very graciously accepted our invitation to deliver a lecture at ICG. This lecture is part of the ICG lecture series on good governance, initiated by us in April 2011 with the inaugural lecture by Justice Retired and Santosh Hegde on role of Lokayuk in good governance. Some of the eminent speakers who have delivered lectures as part of this series include Justice, uh, the late Justice J.S. Varma, Mr. J.M. Lindo, Mr. Kiran Karni, Dr. S.Y. Qureshi, Mr. Shailesh Gandhi, and Dr. Jay Prakash Narayan. Lord Desai will be speaking to us on good governance, key to economic success. Governance, as we all know, is a broad concept covering all aspects of the way a country is governed, including its economic policies and regulatory framework, as well as adherence to the rule of law. Corruption, the abuse of public authority or trust for public, private benefits is closely linked. A poor governance environment offers greater incentives and more opportunities for corruption. Corruption undermines the public's trust in its government. It also threatens market integrity, distorts competition, and endangers economic development. Echoing these same thoughts and concerned over the economic slowdown, the former RBI governor, Dr. V. Subarao, has also said that in the ultimate analysis, it is the quality of governance that separates success and failure in economic development. I'm sure Lord Desai will further enlighten us on this. Please allow me to introduce our eminent speaker to you. Professor Lord Meghnath Jagdish Desai is Emeritus Professor of Economics at the London School of Economics and Political Science. Professor Lord Desai served as Lecturer of Economics at the London School of Economics since 1965 and is Professor from 1983 to 2003. He started his professional career in the Department of Agricultural Economics, University of California in 1963. He established the Center for the Study of Global Governance in 1992. He was created Lord Desai of St. Clement Dales in 1991 and was awarded Padma Bhushan in 2007. Pravasi Bharatiya Puraskar, Distinguished Overseas Indian Award in January 2004 and Bharat Gaurav by the Indian Merchants Chamber in 2002. He was made an honorary fellow of the London School of Economics in July 2005. Professor Lord Desai studied at the University of Bombay and PhD at the University of Pennsylvania. He is a recipient of several honorary degrees from universities such as Kingston, Middlesex, East London, London, Guildhall. The present economic crisis the result of external factors or internal factors? Is the economic slowdown the result of global factors or the result of wrong policy decisions by the government of India? What is the myth? What is the reality? Whom do we believe? And what do we believe? Fortunately for us, we have gathered today at the International Centre Goa. We have in our midst the very eminent and Lord, the learned Lord Desai, a scholar, an intellectual, academic, and an expert in economics, who will explain to us what has gone wrong with the India growth story. His topic is good governance, key to economic success. I invite Lord Desai to deliver his lecture. I think there are, there are, there are two issues which have been raised uh, by, uh, you know, Nadir Kaha, Shikamburka. What is in what is governance, and what do we understand by governance? Secondly, what explains the recent slowdown in Indian economic growth? And it says how how are these two uh, connected? Now, I can give you a perfectly sound explanation of why growth has gone down without referring to governance at all. And there are contingent short-run factors which one can explain uh, the slowdown of economic growth. Uh, you know, maybe something to do with the foreigner, federal reserve, eurozone, things like that. Something to do with uh, the persistence of inflation. Something to do with policy paralysis. The big question, I think, implicit in the uh, mind of lots of people, is, is this slowdown permanent? Or is it temporary? Is the slowdown in any economic growth 
due to much more structural fundamental reasons, which will not be overcome simply by a change of government. The people haven't quite rated it, but that, that is, the fear really is, has India gone back to its old ways? And uh, when we examine the history of especially last three or four years, there has been both been a crisis of governance and a crisis of the economy. And I think implicit in the election battle going on right now, without taking a side in the right, is the argument that decisive leadership, which is an offer from the BJP, will turn the tide around. That all you need is decisive leadership, uh, which will get rid of all this paralysis, which will unblock the blockages which are uh, holding up infrastructure projects or things like that. And all you need is that sort of decisive leadership to replace the mumbling prime minister with a articulate, you know, shouting prime minister, and you're there. Uh, replace a, a sort of a weak will coalition government with a strong will coalition government in that. Now, what I want to argue here is that if we take the notion of governance seriously, and that there is a crisis of governance, it's possible to argue, I should put up on you that, that India's slowdown is due to more fundamental reasons. And unless something is done to reform uh, those things, it would be unlikely that we will uh, to get out of this slow growth process and on to a high growth rate. So it's not merely a question of uh, getting the economics right, getting, say, investment right, saving right, you know, interest rates lower and so on. Some of those. Uh, some of the ills are more deeper than that. that. Now, you know, it is, it's interesting that the word governance was not used 20 years ago. Uh, I, I remember, sorry, something kind of reading me. Uh, uh, I, when I started my Center for the Study of Global Governance in 1992, uh, governance was still a relatively unused word. It was not unknown word, but it was unused word. And uh, I remember when I was uh, wondering at the novelty of the word, uh, a very good friend uh, in the UK pointed out to me that the word governance is in the Book of Common Prayer. And he pointed out very close. So governance was supposed to be the way God governs. God's governance was was one. But I think where it actually comes from in the late 80s, early 90s, was a breakdown in the old debate about the state versus the market, of socialism versus capitalism. And basically the socialist alternative had disappeared, had collapsed and disappeared. I know this is news in India, but it has, it has collapsed and disappeared. And the old debate of state versus market, which was going on mainly in capitalist countries, it was not going on in socialist countries, had to be redefined by the people who were statists as it were, had to redefine it. And the people who were, as it were, on the free market side, were also trying to refashion their ideas not on the basis of extreme lazy fair, as I would call it, but on the grounds that markets needed regulatory structures. So governance became the word in which we didn't talk about government. You know, had I started the Center for Global Government, I would have been denounced if somebody is trying to federalize the whole world and one world state and so on. Nobody wanted a one world state. But people were willing to argue about what were the rules of global governance? What were the rules under which relations between nations 
was organized. I mean, recently we have been through the whole Syrian question, which has been a test of global governance. Because the idea was we have set up institutions of the United Nations, we have conventions against chemical weapons, we have the United Nations Charter, which is under Arctic, uh, Chapter 6 and Chapter 7, can enjoin nations to do something to interfere in other nations' affairs under certain conditions. Now, were the conditions fulfilled for UN intervention? within the rules of global governance or not. Because unilateral action by United States, UK, or France would not have been within the rules of global governance. It may have been effective, it may not have been effective, but it would not have been under the rules of global governance. What has happened now, or it is still happening, is more under the rules of global governance. So I think governance meant, uh, as as uh, I said, sort of institutions, rules, conventions, norms, within which uh, executive action can be carried out. Within which executive actions can be carried out. Uh, and I'm saying executive action because mainly uh, the, the scope for action comes from the executive. Uh, and the idea is what are the limits under which an executive action can be carried out? Now, coming to the Indian context, I think in a sense, uh, certainly compared to the 1950s, when the institutions were set up, parliament, constitution, parliament, Judiciary, executive rules on every executive operate today, independent civil service, the police system, the army, and so on. Uh, the system was set up, and by and large, the executive acted within the system. It's partly because of uh, the prime minister who imposed a constraint on himself. The only major violation of that was when the, the government of Kerala was removed uh, under very dubious circumstances, but we were able to secure that in parts. I think what has happened is that uh, increasingly in India, the argument is that the legitimacy of a democratic election, which the parliamentarian has, especially the elected government has, allows it to override rules of governance. The culture, I think the deterioration of the culture has been for the last 40 years, I mean, this, is, this is nothing, nothing new. But increasingly, there was an idea of the mandate. It's an idea which comes from a, from a where the, the Leninists left, uh, which uh, Indira Gandhi adopted. That once you were elected, your mandate from the people meant that there were no restraints on your power. And all restraints such as constitution and so on and uh, I mean the whole debate about the uh, right to property right, right to private property. About the big battle was fought in the seventies, and ultimately the Supreme Court laid down laid down the limits under which governments can operate was an example of how the executive tried to break out of uh, the rules, but failed. Now, I think over the years, uh, the judiciary is there to point out the limits of uh, the rules under which the executive can act. But the legislature is no longer powerful enough to check in, in, in the UK, for example, uh, which is the legislature in which I operate, uh, the executive is held to account much more continuously, much more thoroughly by the legislature than it is the case here. And it's not just a question of people rushing to the well and all that. I mean, those are symptoms of the impotence of the legislature because the legislature cannot actually hold the executive to account. Very 
That has happened steadily without any change in the Constitution. It has happened, it's a one step on to admit. It happened steadily whereby the executive has taken more and more power to determine the business of the legislature, the order in which it will be operated, and when debates will start, debates will finish. This is not the case in, 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 the, in the UK Parliament, I can tell you. The government has limited power on the timetable of, of, of the legislation. Now, the one big difference was Schedule 9, which was uh, about, about party defections. The, when, when the legislation was passed about prohibiting defections from parties that hire and hire and practice. But what it is meant is that a party in Parliament has its members controlled entirely by the, by the whip and the leadership. And the backbenchers have to vote more or less according to as the chief whip lays it down. And there's very little freedom for a backbencher to deviate from the party's policy. Now I have I have thrown my twenty no, whatever it comes to toward my uh, twenty-two years in uh, in uh, House of Lords. I have been I've been occasionally defined of my party, but I've, I've often taken the view that my party is wrong and I can go there. No matter my party doesn't like it, but that's not anything to know about. Nor in the House of Commons. In the House of Commons, you know, most, most recently, when Cameron lost the vote on Syria, it was very much because a number of conservatives voted against, a number of conservatives absented themselves, and so on. So the kind of freedom is no longer there. So the legislature as a check on the executive is gone. Uh, the executive is more or less rampant uh, and uncontrollable except by the judiciary, except by the higher judiciary. Now, in return, what the executive has bribed the parliamentarians with is immunity from law, more or less. If you are a parliamentarian, you can more or less get away with anything. You know, I mean, the, the, the number of cases pending against parliamentarians on a variety of things, and the degree to which they, they know they are not going to be brought, brought to justice. Their, their behavior, both within parliament and outside parliament, is overbearing. Their privileges are extensive which should not be allowed. Nobody has actually costed, or maybe somebody had, what a parliamentarian costs. It's not just a salary, it's the value of the house and, 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 the, and the transport and so on. I can tell you, as a member, member of the House of Lords, I have no privileges. I can only claim travel if I live outside London. And uh, I don't have a salary, I only have a daily allowance there to earn it uh, and somebody marks me off uh, president or not. The House of Commons people also are very limited. Nobody has housing in, in, in British Parliament given to them for free, etc. So the, the deal is come to Parliament, we'll make it worth your while, which is why some people pay 100 crores to get into right as well, and don't ask questions. Now within this structure, the executive has been allowed to undermine institutions quite, quite blatantly. It was a whole saga of the CAG, and I mean, one, one must pay tribute to, to that office that they, it, it has held up its end and not actually uh, been, uh, been bullied by the executive, but the CAG, the, CV, uh, the Central Regional Commission, uh, the CBI is currently fighting for some sort of autonomy as vis-a-vis -vis the executive. Uh, now, what is true is that if the executive does not honor the independence of the, the institutions which are there, except for the Supreme Court, there is no other, other uh, stoppage. By and large, the opposition may shout about it, 
but they either do not have the means of stopping the executive or they do not exercise the maximum power they could within the rules of parliament to stop it. And uh, this is, I think, the crisis of governance. And one of the reasons for the crisis of governance, in my view, which is, uh, which is connected to the corruption issue, because the corruption in Indian politics is what I would call endogenous. It is part of the system. It sustains the system. And it is very difficult to eliminate corruption without, without reforming the whole system. And the reason is that uh, the mode of election financing in India is completely opaque. I, I have lived through, in, in British context, of much more openness and accountability about party financing. What money the party receives you know, has to be publicly recorded. Uh, what 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 uh, donations and every donation has to be declared online. Uh, indeed, even after passing the fairly stringent legislation uh, about party financing, my own party, when in power, tried to circumvent the legislation. You know, I mean, this is this is not not just an Indian disease. They invented the idea that if somebody gives a loan to the party, that doesn't have to be counted for in their accounts because it's a commercial, uh, for commercial reasons that we kept a secret. Now, those, those were not, not illegal, but it was illegal to take a loan against a promise of uh, preferment. And it turned out that people had given loans on the hush-hush promise of a peerage. And when, when that came out, a huge scandal broke out. The police took interest. The police were arresting members of the Prime Minister's office uh, for the likely charge that they had taken money in return for a promise of peerage to the donor. Of course, once you got the peerage, the loan didn't have to be repaid. Uh, and you see, so one has to be very vigilant. Even in good systems, there are ways of people fighting breaking. In India, because there is no really effective law about parliamentary election financing. And what there is, is actually not good enough. We all know that the spending on election is a very high multiple of what appears on, on the record books. In the, recently when Tamil Nadu had its state elections, uh, the election commission people discovered one van belonged to the Allegheny faction of the DMK, which had 73 crores of rupees in cash. I mean, it is a staggering sum of money to have in cash. And it was just one instance in which it was found out. I mean, how much money is being spent recently? Uh, I forget who it was in Bombay. Who who say, oh, you know, I don't say these guys spend much, much, much more than <laughs> the total embarrassment. We don't even know. Now, I think absolutely central to governance, governance reform, corruption reform in India, would be a seriously uh, good legislation about election financing. It's not to restrict election spending but it's to make it transparent. Just as in America, there are these political action committees which give outrageous sums of money to two parties, and indeed the Supreme Court ruled that there could be no restriction on the ability to give money to political funding, uh, the, the, the US Supreme Court. Uh, I mean, there is no reason why, uh, which you know, said, that all sorts of donations are acceptable as long as they are declared. Obviously, some people have money which they don't want to be declared because they haven't paid tax on it. Uh, but by and large, even, you know, even some attempt to uh, make the election financing system transparent for people, I'll tell you why it is scarce. Because if elections have to be financed with black money, one of the things that the executive has to do is to generate funds for election financing. And a lot of the leakage is in corruption. The sort of leakage that Rajiv Gandhi talked about 
which still go along this year in Pakistan, that out of such and such spending of the government on some cause, only a fraction goes to the real job and the rest disappears. But where do the rest disappear? You know, it may go to people's pocket, but very often it has to come out of people's pocket into the party funds. I mean, uh, Kiran Kumar Reddy, uh, who's Chief Minister of Andhra, just said as much uh, about 10 days ago. He said, well, why is everybody complaining about money being going away? It comes back. It comes back into, into, into party, party spending. And it's perfectly systematic. I mean, people are told to take money so that they have to give it back. Okay, they may take a cut, but they say, this is not a, this is not a the free for all. And, and this, this system of party financing was installed by Indira Gandhi long ago, and it has continued. And it is, it's a normal secret. I mean, uh, people don't write about it, it's a normal secret. Now, I said nothing about the legality of illegal, but it's illegal. I said nothing about the morality of it. Uh, the point is that if we were able to make election financing transparent, some of the money need not leak out. Elections may get less expensive, you know, and, and government money on, say, on road building or, or Narega or food security may actually go for what it is supposed to go for. Now, this, I believe, is uh, very much at the root cause of the erosion of governance and its consequent effect on economic policy uh, that we have witnessed in the last five years. Uh, and it's been going on for quite, quite a long time. But I think the amazing thing to happen in the last five years, and again, it's an unintended consequence of, uh, of, of another factor. Uh, so the media revolution, uh, fact that you we, we could have private TV channels in communication satellite makes everything very easy. And then lots of people want to start TV channels. They probably want to start TV channels because that's a very good way of laundering black money. But you know, we'll, we'll, leave, we'll leave that aside. The media revolution in India has meant that the sorts of things which could be hidden before can no longer be hidden. And there are multiple number of young people whose career depend upon filling 24 hours on television, and they need things to talk about. And starting with the Allah Hazare, and starting with the Commonwealth Games uh, thing, uh, tragedy, uh, we have had a continuous media exposure of government and of corruption, like nothing I have seen in the past. We have four years of running commentary, maybe three, three, three and a half of running commentary on one thing after another going wrong. The CW is a very interesting example because the CW scandal was not exposed by Indian media. It arises from a real fact of greed, which is that the people who, there was a program of handover of the Olympic flames. I was there on a wintry day in the in the forefront of Buckingham Palace. It was a terrible program, but people had that. The people who had organized the program have been uh, very used car salesmen. And in against this income they had got, they wanted to claim VAT uh, concession. And the income tax office in the UK, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs said, this is not your business. How could you be claiming uh, you know, a VAT concession for this? Where did you get this money from? What is the basis of this, of this income? That is what actually raised questions about the legitimacy of the contract we awarded to the UK. And that's what started the entire yeah, that's, that's a nice effect of globalization. But you don't know where Indian corruption will be exposed, which corner of the world Indian corruption will be exposed. And so, you know, if you contrast the Beaufort stuff and all these other things, these other things are moved a lot faster than Beaufort's ever did. So, we have 
Yeah, but the exposure doesn't actually mean tackling of the crisis because the executive still has, has quite a lot of power to it. So one other thing we'll have to do, we'll have to, uh, okay, I don't know anybody's going to do it, but uh, there will have to be a serious reform of uh, election financing in India. There will have to be a serious reform of the powers of the bank benches, like uh, the removal of land schedule of the constitution. Uh, I mean, it's a very obscure thing, and, and I, when I go on about it, people kind of don't know what it is. But it really kills the power of backbenchers. What it means is ultimately in parliament, the chief whips of the parties can get together and determine what will happen. And the same thing happens in legislation. The legislation, the detailed legislation, are fixed by the leaders of the parties. The, the negotiator in the standing committee. And very little real debate happens on the floor of the House. Very little real debate happens on the floor of the House. I cannot imagine some, a bill like the Food Security Bill being passed in the British Parliament in, you know, in three days. It is no way uh, we, will, we, will, we will pass it. Uh, I mean, if within a House of Lords itself, there will be about 300 amendments before, before we go any further, each of which shall be discussed and voted upon. Anyway, so I think parliamentary, you know, we have to re-establish separation of powers, real effective check on the executive, uh, not just the judiciary doing all the hard work in the system. And that will make the, the executive be much more uh, obedient to the structure of governance within which it has to operate. And if it did not have to raise all that money, it would not have to be so corrupt. It's very simple. You know, all this is all this is endogenous. All this happens for some reason, and it is not purely uh, private private uh, gain. Uh, I mean, it, some of it is private gain, but a lot of it is for for uh, sustenance of the democratic electoral structures of India. So. My view is that if institutional reform is not done by whoever comes to power in 2014, I don't think one can, one can, one can assure ourselves that any revival in growth will be permanent. You know, okay, one way you can say is that there is so much black money floating around that all the numbers of our national income, etc., are fake. The real numbers have come somewhere else, maybe much larger. The Indian income is really growing quite a lot, but we just don't know. But you know, I mean, that, that is, I don't think that is uh, a, an alibi for not doing anything. Even if that were true, I still think it's worthwhile to make all that black money come out into the open and, and stop a business system. I mean, a lot of the uh, sort of corruption inherent in land deals, which is which is which kind of, is very much because of the fact that the whole uh, uh, ownership and transfer and pricing of land has become a real big scandal in which uh, quite a lot of money is siphoned off. And, uh, I mean, it's a very, very interesting example of. Uh, uh, chairman of the Bombay uh, Mumbai Pradesh Congress Committee. Uh, his name will come to me in a minute, but uh, uh, he, uh, when he became chairman, he went to a bank, uh, I think it was a, a public sector bank, and asked for a loan of uh, you know, some crores. And he had no collateral, but he was chairman, so he was given the loan. Then with that loan, he and his son bought some property. And they bought the property, they went back to the bank and said, give us some more money against the collateral of this property. And very soon, a huge fortune was built by this man. The only asset he had was he was chairman of the Pradesh Congress Committee. Hey, the whole Robert Vatra case is very interesting because Robert Vatra said, I don't want any money, I don't want any money. He doesn't have to have any money. He can enhance the value of a land by his word of mouth. And anywhere between any amount of money, whether the property goes whatever it is, 90 lakhs to 
So we did crowds, you know. <laughs> we could change the views. So this sort of power is casual. And that I think why people pay hundred crores to get in the right of the world. And so something about the system has picked up. Now, as I said, if you don't do this, the short run correction of, of the short run decline in income, uh, in income growth may be corrected for a bit, but eventually the system will once again run into the same barriers under a different government. But that doesn't make any difference. Because we've been through this cycle. We've been through the Tehelka scandal during the NDA time. And NDA was doing perfectly well, trying to be good to reform it. The Tehelka scandal happened and they completely lost away. The last two years of NDA government, no reforms happened because of political, uh, uh, political compulsions that dominated. So I think one has to really say we all love democracy, and Indian democracy is one of the great great achievements of, of, of independent India. But the way the elections are conducted has entrenched corruption into the system in a functional way. Corruption is functional to the system. It is not arbitrary. In a dictatorship, the dictator takes all the money, and maybe it's few of his cronies. In India, the corruption is through the democratic, to democratize corruption to anybody who has to find an election. And so elections and corruption are so deeply and functionally connected that it will take a really fundamental reform of the system for us to get good governance again. And by the same token, it will be parliamentary reform. We'll have to get executive under some kind of control so that executive behaves itself. And in that context, one can imagine systems, uh, so economic policy making and so on, which will be speedy. And obviously some people like Wilson and Dad say basically the problem is just do less. Let the government do less, let the people do more. And but that is not possible unless the government can afford to do this. Right now the government can't afford to do this. It has to do more just to be able to survive. So in order for the government to do less, to be truly reforming and so on, it has to have the, uh, the willingness and the capacity to reform. Now, you know, you, you, I can, I can uh, throw the thing over to debate if you want to uh, uh, tell me I'm, I'm being far too uh, uh, extreme about the financing. So as far as I can see, program after program which is introduced is introduced with a perfect knowledge that there are leakages. You know, not only the Rajiv Gandhi's famous sentence about 15% uh, you know, effective 85% not. I mean in the recent debate in, in, uh, in Lok Sabha on the food security, the government admitted that there's a 35 to 40% wastage. I mean, it's perfect and it's almost a perfectly normal thing. 35 to 40% is a lot of money for 1.25 lakh crores. You know, it didn't, it didn't like uh, uh, 50,000 crores of money. And, you know, even if you have, you know, I don't know how many poor there are, <laughs> but if there are 50 crore poor, that's a thousand crores, you know, and whatever it is, uh, yeah, that a uh, thousand rupees, uh, you know, free to each each poor person uh, that uh, that you're wasting. So anyway, uh, let me let me let me conclude uh, by saying that I think emerging economies, so called, have grown quite a lot in the last ten years. But across emerging economies, again and again, many of them are running into the same sort of barriers of governance. Brazil is a very good example, which again, after a spurt of growth, has hit into the corruption of the system and so on. China has a lot of corruption. Now, it is true that you cannot have a permanently growing economy 
he was just as good as Karamsha. You know, it's always a big deal whether Karamsha helps growth or doesn't help growth and so on. And a lot of Asian countries are caught up in so on. I think there has to be a, a, a question about the ability of the system to grow on a permanent basis if there's corruption. Because one is not sure that the return to investments are going to come to you. Uh, all that, all the returns which are to be earned require investment of real resources rather than just of uh, you know, political clouds and so on. So in the, if, you're, if you're going to get a, a regular economic system, people make investments, uh, start businesses, uh, take risks with their careers, they have to be able to expect unhindered returns. And in India, it is true that there is a substantial surplus padding of costs, which legitimate businesses have to uh, uh, adjust to. And the consequence is not adjusting to a more severe uh, than we contemplate. And again, just to say, what we have written the last three, four years, the, the breakdown in the coal delivery system, the mining system, uh, the, the infrastructure bottlenecks, all of them, all those bottlenecks and policy paralysis have risen from the problem of corruption. There is, I'm told, in Delhi, no civil servant is moving any files because they're worried about what the CAD will do to them, uh, or things like that. And so, you know, if this is a, we are in transition and we'll have to do something about it. Now, let me just finally say, I'm very pessimistic that the political system has the will to do this. I think only the civil society can do it. I think civil society has to take uh, its role much more seriously and its cloud much more seriously. The most surprising thing to me is how much uh, business in India uh, is very much uh, uh, pusillanimous about exercising its power. It's the, the, the kind of cow talk in a shameful fashion uh, when confronted with the chief minister or prime minister uh, or even, you know, even Vice President of the Congress Party, uh, who, 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 who constitutionally has absolutely no role in anything. But let me, let me, let me just, I'll say this parenthetically add that there are things done within the Constitution by people who have absolutely no constitutional power. The Vice President of the Congress Party has absolutely no power. I don't see why advertisements appear as the President of, of, paid for by the government. They're not part of the government. They're a political party. It will be a scandal in the UK if somebody tried to do that. Anyway, that, that's parenthetical. But I think uh, civil society, a coalition of civil society people, and there are lots of very good people, will have to take up some of these issues in a kind of systematic way and insist on alternatives maybe at, at election times, maybe by supporting parties which will be to do these things or not. And, uh, uh, you know, countries know how to solve the problems they get into. Go and study the history of America from 1880 to 1910. And it's exactly what happened there. And the system actually got out of it by political public participation. It was called new politics in those days. And that is where reform came from. So reform can come, but reform can only come from civil society goading the political system to cure itself. And that is the only way to ensure that economic success would be permanently entrenched in the system. Okay, thank you. Uh, your talk, uh, Professor Desai. Uh, there are, uh, what I have noticed is 
the, the only two examples that I uh, can give of economic su success are the United States and the United Kingdom. Uh, the United Kingdom in reference to the House of Lords and the United States in reference to the political change that came out at uh, the turn of the 20th century. All right. um, to me, none of these is, uh, uh, are particularly successful economies. None of the, uh, the UK nor the US are particularly successful. And emulating their path will not, I believe, uh, serve India in the short run. It may in the long run, but it's too long for me to get. Uh, so let me uh, ask you for your opinion on uh, another country where corruption is deeply entrenched and legitimized, Singapore. Do you have any views on uh, if Singapore, with its, uh, its legitimized entrenched corruption, has any lessons for India? First of all, uh, first of all let me say that I do not share your uh, uh, dismissal of US and UK. They may not be growing very much time, but they have grown for a long, long time. And you know, a one percent growth of the U.S. economy is larger than the number. I mean, the reason the Federal Reserve can move markets across the world it is because you know, you know what the Federal Reserve does still has enough clout to. So I think yes, they are going to temper difficulties, and I only refer to House of Lords, but I really want to bring to the strength of Parliament and the check on the executive and, and the system and so on. And U.S. I only refer to 1880s because I've already got an example of how the system could cure itself. Now, you know, it is, it is a legitimate question that, in a sense, corruption doesn't necessarily harm growth. It's legitimate argue. Uh, you know, South Korea has been corrupt as hell for a long time. Uh, Japan has been corrupt. Uh, Singapore has been corrupt. And, and so, so what's wrong with corruption? So then we may ask ourselves, is that, are there different kinds of corruption which are efficient and corruption which are not efficient? And uh, I, you know, uh, I would, I would, uh, I would venture to guess no more than that. That there is corruption which delivers and corruption which doesn't deliver. You know, that in a sense, what what it is is that uh, list, listed prices are not true reflections of the scarcities. And so somebody asks for something more to bring up the listed prices, and it's the market imperfection is corrected by corruption. That is my view. And that? Sir, <coughs> yeah. sir uh, can I, uh, first of all, thank you for your very uh, thorough lecture. Can you introduce yourself, please? Uh, my name is Lakshman Pardanani. I'm a CA from London. Uh, can I suggest you an alternative version of the Indian profile, of the Indian political profile? Uh, first of all, our corruption is of a very special nature. I mean, it seemed that the whole society seemed to be anesthetized by corruption. And I was pleased that you mentioned the fact that the corruption at the lower levels is in fact much more insidious than corruption at the higher levels. I mean, you don't see it in England, for example. Um, the other thing that worries me about India a, a lot is the fact that we seem to have a dying feudal respect for authority. We, we seem not to be able to respect the people who are contrarians, as it were, see, which worries me a great deal. And the third thing about India that worries me as well is the fact that we don't seem to have respect for the rule of the law. We just don't seem to observe the rule of the law at all. We, we seem to have, in fact, pride in being able to break it. And the more affluent you are, the more powerful you are, the greater pride you exhibit in breaking the law. And this is where I slightly disagree with you, that um, um, we should change the law. You can violently disagree. Okay, I'm the working president, Vishwa uh, Firstly, let me deal with you. We are in correspondence. We are in correspondence, yes. Of the social reform that we talked about in the Hindu community, if you look in the past, okay, what was done during the colonial times, all these reforms okay, were led by the Hindus themselves. And there are all the reforms were led by the Hindus themselves. You can see the question of Brahma Samaj, and you can see okay, everything that happened by people like Ranade in Avastra. And there are records to prove 
that because the colonial administration is okay, that voted against those reforms rather than the Hindus who okay, the counter committee members. So let's not talk about the kids who Hindus okay not doing social reforms. Even post-independence, you see the Hindu court bill and other particular things that have happened. Recently, okay, there have been laws that have been passed on marriage, okay, where the work, uh, you know, where the wife will get 50% of the ancestral property, which is in the rubbish, which doesn't exist anywhere, which applies only to the Hindus. So I think that's the correction that I would like to make. You mentioned, I mean, essentially that what I get a talk from you as good governance, right? is not the question of election for you. Uh, that is really the primary particular goal that is there. But you also mentioned that there's a corruption in China and there is no elections in China. Right? So election funding and corruption, okay, election funding leading to corruption is a wrong cause and effect to take the, the, you know, the, the, you know, the relationship. The real relationship is that there is an opportunity for corruption in the system and that is why people want to get elected and that is why people spend more money. I think unless until if you want to have poor governance, okay, you have to deal with those opportunities for corruption and not do it by the election funding. Even in America today, there is the election funding available, but no president okay, takes care, takes advantage of it. He doesn't take state funding. You all the time, okay, because okay, there are, you know, it doesn't it does it so much. And there are all uh, uh, Mrs. Mrs. Jokla and I are, I are all sparring partners, and uh, we have uh, we, we, we have a debate. Uh, uh, let me go to the the principal thing now. Come to the other ones. What is there's a causality? If there is no causality about corruption in election systems, that it is not because the election system that the corruption is there, but because there are opportunities for corruption which then attracts people uh, to the electoral system. I mean, you know, in a sense, uh, there, there are, in, in economics, I'm used to some of the link, uh, you know, that could be called and effect both ways, and, you know, that thing could be interdependent. Uh, obviously, the government having access to power allows you to hold up. With the power, power access to government means that you can either get something speeded up or something held up. So timing of the essence, you can convert the time into money. Somebody will pay you money to expedite the contract, or somebody will pay you money not to hold up uh, something. Uh, or, for example, in case of 2G and so on, people people will pay you to uh, subvert the tendering process and, and, and give you a gift. Now, obviously, Non-transparency of decision making in the government means that people can do this and they are not open. Uh, but people get money for it, so being in the government, that is, that is a... So if you are in the government, if you're in the political system, you can make money, but in order to get into the political system, you have to spend money to get into the government. So that is the simultaneity of all these things. Now, where my, my view is that uh, in China and Singapore and things like that, the corruption is there, but democracy not being there. Corruption is un unchallenged. In India, it, and, and even in Japan, the democracy is quite sort of paternalistic, the party system. In India, in the last five years or so, the media has exposed corruption much more effectively which I know you're shaking your head and you're not convinced, but you, I'm never going to convince you. So I'll let, let me at least put my, let, let, me, let, me, let me at least put my. So I think, I think that the simultaneity of corruption and election uh, and media exposure has led to the paralysis of the system. Now, how are you going to cure it? One way to cure it is to make the election financing more transparent. You disagree? And then I think one will be able to cure uh, the make the decision making more transparent, and that's part of good governance in that. Uh, you know, it may not be stopped, but I think I can. Also, now about 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 the Hindu reform and so on. Uh, you know, we we could have another debate. But basically, a lot of the old Hindu reform was about practices of the upper caste. In you know, the widow remarriage was only a part of the Brahmins. In the lower class, the middle who remarried all the time. If you read Kosambi on this, you know, Kosambi is very convincing on this. That all the reform process is pre-colonial. 
going to do with, with, with a small upper crust of it. But we'll, we'll, we'll never agree about that, so I will, I will leave it. Uh, let, let me ask other people. Uh, yeah. You need a decision. My name is Juino D'Souza and I come from Borhoro. For the last few minutes I have been hearing this word corruption, corruption, corruption and various suggestions have come as to how we eliminate corruption, how can we have an, an election which is corruption free, so on and so forth. But in India I must tell you, you have a unique type of corruption. First it's called honest corruption, dishonest corruption and then you have what is called as hafta or kickbacks. Would you like to comment on these three types of corruption? which is totally unique in India? I don't know it's unique to India. I don't at all unique to Honest India. corruption but is that a person know, takes I the money and does his work. No, no, I this honest is he takes the money and does not do the work. So what do you feel about this? Which is very peculiar in India. You have politicians who say, don't worry, I'll do your work, you give me the money. Yeah, but they take the money, come Your question is understood. Yeah. No, this is the, the, I live in a country where I can get my electricity, my water, everything without paying anybody any extra money. Okay? When I came to Goa, I wanted broadband because I was reading a newspaper, broadband was available. So I said, how do I get a broadband? Somebody said, go see your MLA. I said, why should you see my MLA to get a broadband? Why can't government broadband commercially? You know, systems have been created where you have to go to these people. They're completely unnecessary. There should be no reason why I should go to my MLA to get my broadband. I should be able to get my broadband commercially. I mean, when I give the example of the, of the, the, the uh, Transparency International, who were paying 800 crores a bribe, they were paying bribes for things which were, they were entitled to straight away. You know, to get a a certificate of your land ownership and land registry should not require to file an FIR in the police, should not require you pay the police money to write one FIR. You know, I mean, artificial scarcity have been created by access to power. These are no, there are no scarcities, natural scarcities. People are blocking things. There is, there is, I can only describe this in Gujarati. There was a story about this man who stands at a, at a start of town, at the beginning of a, a border of town. If anything moves, he says, you have to pay money. I don't know if you can understand what Rani ka sala. Uh, uh, Rani ka sala. And the Rani cannot have a sala. But he says, Rani ka sala. That immediately stops people to pay money. Now that's an artificial scarcity created. Now throughout the uh, Indian political system, where people are entitled to think as of right, artificial scarcity has been created by people regarding, uh, regarding access. And if you are a political person, you can get access. And then you are on the other side. Then, you know, I don't think it's unique to India, but it is an interesting thing. Now, you know, uh, in, in, in some political systems, uh, people take money to deliver uh, goods. In others, they, they they take money to deliver goods. But I think in India, they, they probably take money to deliver goods but at an inflated price. Uh, Prakash, sir, you rightly said in the beginning that uh, we are changing the government unless, unless it is willing to have institutional reform, it will not bring about it. If we recall that uh, as far as the electoral reform, Goswami Committee report of Janata days. After that, government changed. Nobody touched. We have a law commission making uh, thousands and thousands of pages of uh, reform, electoral reforms. Nobody has touched. Then we come to a uh, big Anna Hazare movement you spoke about, where uh, we saw people, political parties taking to states all across the country. Then follows when actual uh, thing comes, like say Goa, Lokayutta Act, we have, we put in place very weak and ineffective legislation. Come to Gujarat, same thing we have witnessed, what kind of uh, uh, structure is being put in place, law. 
so what exactly is the hope on this institutional thing? You know, well, what I find very surprising in India is people still have hope that a new law will cure things. There is absolutely no shortage of laws in India. You know, I remember the 1950s, there were laws, there was Sandalam Commission, things like that. I mean, 1940, there is a book by Paul Brass on Chalancing, in which he quotes in 1946, but it is said uh, that in the new UP legislature, the Congress MLAs had broken every section of the Indian people in court in terms of the corruption and bad behavior. In 1946, he was worried about corruption. The thing is, it's, it's about behavior, it's not about law. Sir, the intent also is important. No, 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 no. The problem is, the law has to be implemented. Punishment has to be taken out. And in, even if somebody was brought to justice, it then take 11, 12, 13 years to get anything done. Why should anybody worry about law? And if you're at all within the uh, political system, you're immune. I mean, the way the CBI is switched on and off on the Taj conspiracy case or the photo scam case, you know, I mean, it, the system has not become shameless. It's breaking. And so I think I am not at all sure that having a new law pass bill is going to do anything. I think the government was foolish in resisting Anna Hazare. If you want a law pass bill, you want your law pass bill, here it is. We will pass it. You know, passing bill has nothing. Uh, you know, I mean, and uh, you know, there are laws against for administrative reforms, domestic violence, respecting women against. The cause of discrimination. Nothing happens. Brides still get burned for damage, you know. Nothing happens. So I think it is really a question why do we trust governments and laws so much to cure the problems that governments and laws have created? That is a question India ought to ask itself. That's a question civil society ought to ask itself. What is it that, that will happen? Professor Rahul Tripathi. I am Rahul Tripathi from the Department of Political Science, Goa University. Uh, we have also been in touch and we look forward to your presence in the December conference on a similar theme that we are planning. Uh, my question is a little away from uh, questions of corruption and other things, more to do with economic governance, and that's part of the governance. Uh, there has been a recent debate uh, among uh, two of your contemporary economists, the same and Bhagwati, about what what model is the, the model which is appropriate for India to follow. Uh, whether it's economic growth which will uh, lead to the kind of change that India really needs, or it's more a developmental, social oriented model. So, how do you look at this debate uh, in terms of how it is unfolding now? Yeah, I mean, they, they, are, they, they work my friends, they work they both, both in my friends for a long time. You know, I think it's a, most debates which are either or, are a complete waste of time. Uh, and partly, uh, I mean, let's take growth and development. Development is all the human development things, growth is GDP growth and so on. Now, I don't think that Amartya Sen ever said, or maybe uh, ever really said, that growth is not necessary. He was saying it is not sufficient. And he did not want just growth to be celebrated, because he wanted to look at the social uh, consequences when the economy was growing. Okay? Uh, and so he was saying, well, not growth, but inclusive development. So he goes on. I was, I was, I was part of the human development revolution in the early 1990s when Avadhyay Sen and myself and Mahabhul Haq did all this. So I'm not stranger to that. Jagdish Bhagavad is in a different kind of complaint about Avadhyay Sen. He feels that Avadhyay Sen was in favor of all his planning and socialism when growth was not happening. 
and he did not actually criticize the system then with Bhagavad he was criticizing and now Adhyasana comes on the scene celebrating growth and development and freedom and so on and he felt sort of cheated that he was there and when, when Manmohan Singh happened Bhagavati's message was uh, was kind of you know accepted but he didn't get ownership of it and suddenly everybody thinks about the Sanji liberal reform. No, but he's having a clever man, you know. Uh, he's, uh, <laughs> I think that there is a missing link between the two. I've not taken part in the bit because you know, think of taking it to write a whole book about this. Which is that Indian growth has not been employment generating fundamental problem of Indian economy, especially in the last five years, last four and a half years, there has been zero net employment growth. And uh, the relation between growth of income and growth of employment in India is very weak. The reason is that we have not reformed our labor laws. India has not got a substantial manufacturing industry. India has not industrialized. We have gone from agricultural services. And the share of manufacturing in GDP has been more or less constant. And they all launch new manufacturing policies saying, come to an ACZ, you can break labor laws. Right? But people are not interested in breaking labor laws. They buy the land and don't produce because having land much more profitable than, than our manufacturing. So, I, government after government, I've been arguing for 30 years, remove, is India has made its cheap labor the most expensive input in the whole world. And there are kind of large factories that Bangladesh can have, or Malaysia can have, or Singapore can have. We don't have. Now, Amartya Sen previous Bangladesh, but he doesn't see that Bangladesh is prosperous because Bangladesh has been able to remove people from that and give them industrial employment. In every country around the world, many jobs in the manufacturing industry are the best jobs that unskilled and civil skilled people can have. They're around the year, they're permanent, they're secure. What's happened in India is we have a very small manufacturing sector, highly capital intensive, and because hiring of labor is expensive, there's a lot of contract labor. What happened in Manas and in Malati is a tragedy of contract labor. Contract labor is hired and fired as you like, and there's a lot of dissatisfaction. So we have created for four to five percent of labor in the organized sector. There are something like 170 laws. For the 96 percent informal sector, there are no laws. And this is called socialism. You know, and government after government, I argue with my, they're all my friends in the government, and they've denied that this could be relevant. Now, it, in a there are 113 different inspectors who visit factories in the year. I, I, I don't know how many told us. You know, it's impossible to do business. Person after person is telling me that to do manufacturing in India, it's not becoming impossible. We did everything very, 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 very sharply, thanks to Narega and all the things. Not a bad thing. But if you raise wages, then you really help reform labor laws to be able to allow manufacturing. Now, the gap between Sen and Bhagwati is the fact that neither of them is facing up to this question. We have far too many people in the rural areas involved in low productivity uh, jobs, which is why we have poverty transfer them to, to good factory jobs, and you get rid of poverty. Get rid of poverty, you know, it, it's nothing new. People, are, all other countries have done it. We haven't done it. We have done it, and this is a big paralysis of the system. The BJP and the government was about to do it, when the Tehelka scandal broke out, and then they, and then they were to get on again. Yashwan Sina was just about to do it. There we are. We have time for one last question. Gentlemen, no. Hello, my name is uh, Dr. Sharma. I'm from the Department Goa University. So it was the accident talk, but uh, you focus more, mostly on corruption and governance. And um, what I understand is corruption is a way of life in India. As you mentioned, Rajiv Gandhi has already realized that. What I personally feel that uh, 
what letting our economy down is that not taking the decision by the decision making authority at the right time and appropriate type of decision. I can give you one example. Like we are now building power plant, not allowing coal to be mined. We are asking industries to come in India like POSCO and all that thing. Again, we are not allowing them to mine the raw material. So what is important is take decision at the right time and appropriately. And which is not happening in the last four or five years. And I will give you another example of that. When I came in 1991 from UK, after doing my PhD, India was burning. There was a social unrest on front of Mandal Commission, economic unrest because we are selling our gold, and political because they were allowing this third fund government and all that. Narsimha Rao came with minority government, government, took appropriate decision and sorted out in five years most of the Indian problem. And at the end of the five years, there was so much positiveness in the society that, yes, we are growing, we can do. And today, the same person who was finance minister and we gave credit that he is the architect of economic reform. And we overlooked the real person, the leader, who allowed this decision to be taken. Now this person is a prime minister, not able to take any decision. And where we are? Whatever is happening to our economy, the secondary thing. What is happening to the young people is that hopelessness, the despondency which has come, and which is really bad. No, I, uh, I, I, can, I can see a point. But what I was trying to say was that the paralysis in the last four years, the paralysis of the last four years is connected with the corruption scandals, which, because they were exposed by a media, which did not happen before, has paralyzed the government. I mean, it is an indicative argument. You know, corruption has been there all the time. Corruption is in other countries. So what's new? What is new is this combination of things. There are corruption scandals being exposed, first by the officials, taken up by the media. That has generated a, a middle class movement, mass movement. The combination of those three things has paralyzed his government. And they're afraid of doing anything, they're afraid of doing anything, and therefore kept on dealing the whole FDI thing. They're in a very cack handed manner. They don't need a legislation. It was an executive decision they could have taken. Now, having taken it, they could have boldly implemented it. But they wouldn't do it. And when they implemented it, they went on putting side conditions 30% domestic thing. You know, the thing of IKEA, you're not a single retail thing, you're a multiple retail because you're going to sell coffee on other thing. In you know, one of these people been, have they not been to IKEA stores elsewhere in the world? And what silly thing have been single and multiple retail? I mean, these are things because they are frightened. These people have been frightened in the last four years. And you, UPA 1 was perfectly all right. UPA 2 has been a, has been a surprising uh, uh, surprising failure. And the reason, so I'm looking for this. What I'm saying, but the purpose of thing was, I can give example for the temporary paralysis of the last four years, this combination of things. But if it is corruption, if it is defiance of the institutional norms, what guarantee is that the next government will not suffer the same? Okay? So decisiveness is one thing. But will the next government also <coughs> run into these problems or not? Now, if we don't do some fundamental reform, then there is no reason why the next government should not run into it. And my example for that is what happened to BJP and DA. BJP and DA, once the Tehalaka said, scandal kind of broke, froze. Not as badly as this one, but they froze more or less, if you, if you recall it. So, there is a reason why, why, why I was saying what I was saying. I was trying to explain the policy paralysis in terms of the corruption and the media exposure. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interconnected argument in my view. And uh, if I was saying that I don't know whether it's permanent or temporary.
Okay, we'll take one more last question. George. Much regard, Professor from Staff College, Hyderabad. Um, one per very small direct question to you. Given the kind of paralysis that we see, a breakdown of all the systems that are that you mentioned, whether it's political, whether it's legal, whether it's parliamentary procedures, or the executive powers, would you recommend a presidential form of government for this country? And if so, how could you how could we bring it about? You know, I'm, I'm a very passionate believer in this. This is the government we have to get working better. You know, there are, there are no men on white horses or women on white horses who are going to solve any problems. You know, this is, you know, Indira Gandhi tried and it failed. You know, one, one person rule doesn't work. Okay, there was two person rule with something that you know, one and a half person rule doesn't work. <laughs> you know, this is too complex a country to be run like that. In one sense, it's a far too intelligent a country to be run like that. Now people are very conscious that they're, they're, they're highly cultured people, they're a highly cultured country. It's not going to be written written in an uh, overwritten like that. You know, in a, in a sense, and this is this is one of the great great beauties and problems of running. So, and you know, in a sense, this was a perfectly well-run country. I mean, this is okay. We, we are all certainly completely despaired, but a there have been good times in the past. Okay, it's not in, and 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 per capita income to raise something like six to eight times what it was, you know, 30 years ago. So it is not that, what it is that we are now impatient. We have seen better days and we cannot understand why those better days are not continuing. It's the same system, same parties, same people. And so the short run question is, is that an explanation? And what I was, what I was implying is I'm going to give an, an explanation of why this paralysis is there. The larger question I'm raising is if you change personnel, if a new party comes to power, suppose BJP and D comes to power, then the end of the role, he decides he wants a prime minister. Will that be enough? Yes. You see, and I'm saying that I believe that the same system can be ground up again into corruption. Unless we do something to reform certain kind of system, I mean, Mr. Chagula said that it is not to do the election plans to do with uh, opportunities for making money. Either way, one has to reform something so that the system functions in terms of long run growth. Uh, and uh, that, that, that is important. I mean, I also believe that the system ought to be fiscally much more responsible. I haven't gone into that argument. I, I think I'm, I'm appalled by how people take deficit as a, as a fact of life. Uh, I mean, the, the, the government of India pays something like 30% of its total revenue in interest payment. And no other country pays 30% of interest on, on, on debt and discharge. It's scandalous, nobody is talking about it. Uh, so, I think this is the system we have to live with. This is the system we have to make work. And there is no better system available. One last question, Dr. Ajit Shirodkar. So, um, thank you, Lord Meghna Desai, for your wonderful uh, lecture. Before I summarize the lecture, I have a question. Actually, summarize what I said. <laughs> uh, I have a question for the topic: Good governance a key to economic success, and I think the audience would also like to hear your answer. You have said that an economy cannot grow permanently if the system is corrupt. You have also said the institutions in this country are broken down. Parliament is non-functional, the executive is corrupt. What do you think are India's chances to get back at a high growth rate, say 8%, 9%, what it enjoyed some time ago? Do you think India can go back to this growth rate and for how long? Well, the, the burden of my talk was that temporarily maybe yes. But I don't know if permanently. 
see, the, the, I, I could be wrong about this, but I, I am absolutely willing to admit that this is a hypothesis. My feeling is that, uh, yes, there are societies which have had corruption and have not had any stock to their growth. But India being an open democratic society with a free press, will find it difficult to have permanently high growth unless it tackles corruption. That is my proposition. And that's where governance comes in. Now, you know, it could be that India may find a successful way to Singaporeize the corruption. But I, I have my doubts. I think it's hard to open a society and be able to do that. Thank you very much. Um, though Lord Desai spoke for a long time and he is not sure whether it can be summarized, I will give it a best shot and try and cull out some of the significant points he made. Lord Desai said that there are problems of governance in this country. The first cause of this problem of governance is electoral funding. He referred to the breakdown of parliament. He referred to the rampant abuse of power by the executive. Elections and corruptions are deeply interconnected in this country. Electoral financing, the opaque and non-transparent electoral financing is the root cause of misgovernance in the country. Parliamentary reforms are a must. Reforms that will curb the rampant abuse of power by the executive. He also said corruption exists in successful economies, but there is corruption which delivers and corruption which does not deliver. He also talked about media revolution in this country in the last few years, and, and the exposes how it has led to a paralysis of decision making. He also said India's problems will not go away by throwing out the present government and bringing in a new government. He also said an economy cannot grow permanently if the system is corrupt. He is very pessimistic that the political class will improve governance. It is only the civil society that can do it. Finally, he said India can go back to high growth rates in the short term, but in the long term, it is difficult for this country to sustain a high economic growth rate. Thank you. Before we do the vote of thanks, I would like to invite Honorable Governor to give a memento to Lord Desai. National Center, um, our President Mr. Yasin Kaapodkar, Trustee Mr. Colin Curry, I would like to give my formal vote of thanks and uh, we hope that you would come here again and honor us with your presence. Thank you very much. <laughs>